One of the issues that we have been addressing continually since, in fact, uh, one of the reasons the platform existed when we started off in May of this year um, was to promote the idea of freedom of speech, of discussion, of discourse, of debate, um, a freedom that we felt had been constrained by a number of, I guess, adverse ideologies that had decided that there was sort of a right and a wrong and that if you were the wrong, you sort of weren't entitled to that opinion, to that idea, to that concept. Um, we've talked repeatedly to large numbers of gifted and individual and intelligent people who have, they felt, been um, their, their, their efforts, their arguments, their debates, their viewpoints, their intuitions have been marginalised. And indeed, that has been pretty much um, a recurrent refrain through Western civilization. Um, I'm old enough to remember that during the 90s and 60s, it was liberals um, who felt that their freedoms and individuals, their rights, uh, their responsibilities were being impinged upon by a conservative uh, ideology and state. And uh, you might well argue that 50 years later, the positions, the roles have been reversed somewhat. Um, and we have talked often and repeated about it on the show and also whether or not um, there it might be a middle ground, a way of resolving these, I guess, cultural disputes, which from an outsider's perspective anyhow seem to be widening. Um, one of those issues was uh, brought into the last parliament, that's before this one was elected, by Chris Farfoy, and it was the idea, and it very much came out as a consequence of the Christchurch massacre undertaken by the lone, um, psychotic Brenton Tarrant, uh, that there should be some suppression of hate speech in this country. Uh, this led to an enormous debate, uh, which excited those particularly who champion freedom of speech and thought to say that, you know, one man's hate speech is another's harsh criticism. Um, one person's hate speech could be interpreted as uh, chilling uh, of those Western ideals of freedom of thought, etc. Um, now, we now know that Kerry Allen, uh, the new, a new Minister of Justice, has decided to walk that back and has decided that the hate speech legislation that had been proposed will now not occur. Interesting decision, actually, because Labour would have had the numbers to do it without anybody else's support um, they've decided to carry on with activist agendas in three waters, uh, with global climate change and emissions and their effects upon uh, farming and rural communities. But they've walked this one in particular back. And now the Minister of Justice is saying, well, we still intend to introduce hate speech legislation, but it will only be to amend, it seems, the Human Rights Act or the Bill of Rights Act or both, um, to uh, ensure that you cannot use hate speech, whatever that might be defined as, against folk for religious persons purposes. Now, yesterday, um, Ted Greensmith Smith, uh, Greensmith West, sorry, uh, hyphenated name, uh, is a lawyer uh, in Auckland, uh, quite an expert in a number of areas, uh, but he wrote a column uh, which was widely published by Stuff. Uh, and that media network, essentially arguing that this has been a back down that should not have occurred and that the government should, in particular, have banned hate speech against uh, folk who uh, are from the LGBTQ community. Uh, his argument is that that speech is still required and uh, that the government's moves um, have been wrong. Uh, Ted Greensmith West is an Auckland-based lawyer specialising in the Treaty of Waitangi, LGBTQ law reform and public policy, and he joins us now. Uh, good afternoon to you, Ted. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. No, it's a pleasure. Um, listen, first of all, you're a gay man, um, and that is relevant to this particular debate because in... Um, the article that you wrote, you itemised a series of occasions on which you personally um, had been targeted um, for being a gay man and 
hate speech had been employed against you, yeah? Mm, that's correct. So, um, you come from the perspective of somebody who... Well, ha can I actually ask how old you are? Because that gives me some perspective of what time <laughs> you live through. Sure thing. Uh, so, I'm, I'm currently 28. Oh, so you're a young man. All right. Um, sorry, you're well, young like to me. Think. You're young to me, anyhow. <laughs> um, yeah, yes, that's right. You've, 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 your, your, your neurons have just, just formed. I think 25 is the sort of <laughs> um, uh, mature age of uh, adulthood these days. Anyhow, carry on. Sorry, Ted. Thank you for establishing that. Now, I have was involved, you would have been perhaps too young to remember the passage of the Homosexual Law Reform Bill or an Act uh, that Fran Weil brought in, I think, 1987. So you would have missed that, wouldn't you? Well, I would have been a, a barely a twinkle in someone's eye at that point. That's right. <laughs> um, but I remember at the time quite a heated debate. It seems to me since that time, and I was in Parliament when all discrimination against gay folk were removed uh, statutorily. Uh, I think I was in Parliament early 90s when that happened as well. Mm. It seems to me since that time that gay folk have been, and lesbian uh, folk have been well accepted into our community. Have I got that wrong? Uh, I think in some ways, it's a tricky one. I think in some ways that's actually quite correct. And I think... Um, I think if you put it within context of, uh, of I don't know, our, our stories or experiences from, from the 80s, I think there has definitely been a, a clear change or a clear improvement. I think it does depend, however, on whereabouts in New Zealand you live. Um, I think it would be wrong for me as someone who lives in, you know, in the largest city in our country to sort of assume that because it's easier for me then therefore life must be peachy for some of our gay community living in some of the more rural parts of the country. Um, and I think, and I think I mentioned this in, in, in my column, is that unfortunately, despite the improvements we have seen, uh, the reality and lived experience of gay, trans, um, LGBT people in New Zealand is to some degree a consistent level of, of uh, homophobia or discrimination, small and large, and part of our everyday lives. Right. So for that reason, your argument is that the government's decision not to press ahead with hate speech is the wrong decision. Is there evidence, though, that gay folk are subject to hate speech that harms them in this country? Absolutely. I think, and I think uh, it's quite, a, and I mean, you know, this is part of the conversation. Um, and it's a really important part of the conversation. And I actually think this is where the government has uh, really done a bad job when it comes to having conversations about this particular policy. Is that, what I mean, what do we mean by hate speech? Because I mean, I provided some examples of some pretty unpleasant things that have said, been said to me in the past. Now, you know, I'm a pretty much a grown adult, despite being 28. <laughs> um, I'm able to take most of it on the chin. Um, what I consider hate speech is not necessarily the casual, everyday, maybe even more sort of extreme forms of insults or nasty things said to me. It's more to do with the things that are given national prominence and what what is currently the law under the Human Rights Act, which ins incites violence. I mean, the best example recently that I can think of is with Brian Tamaki's slightly ridiculous claims that um, gay or, or or lesbian LGBT people uh, are responsible. I think it was in relation to the Kokoda earthquakes. Um, obviously, that's ridiculous, but there are some sectors within our society where it uh, they pick up on messaging like that. Um, and it does result in violence against our communities. Okay. Are you saying, though, that if Brian Tamaki... So I just want to get this into some sort of context. If Brian Tamaki mm. was to say that again tomorrow, that it's because we tolerate um, gay, lesbian, trans folk, um, that the next natural disaster is going to occur, he should be prosecuted for that? Well... 
it's it's not about whether he should or not. The reality is is that if he does say that again tomorrow, he's entirely free from any form of legal legal repercussion. Um, and that's mainly because of the fact that there's no scope under the relevant section in the Human Rights Act um, and because of the fact that the government has chosen not to include LGBT people in their proposed hate speech law reform or, or more specifically, they're kicking the problem to the Law Commission, which is quite common with, with this current lay of the government. What happens is that they will send um, policies that they don't really want to touch into... Uh, the, the phrase in the United States is sending it to committee to die. Basically, it's exactly what happened with the capital gains tax reform, which is it was too controversial, so they send it to a, a uh, you know, a, a, an inquiry-based system and to, um, to something where there's an investigation into it, and then they will shoot it down afterwards and say, this was not a recommendation from us, um, and we'll have nothing to do with it. Okay, but I'll go back to you... Uh, 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 yeah, I'm, uh, the suggestion is that there should be a, a hate speech legislation first of all. So you've agreed with that concept, but well, there there is one. It, it already exists. We that's have right. a framework within the Human Rights Act. That's right. But your your argument is, but that it, it should specifically include um, references to the gay community uh, in toto as as a group who may not be offended against by hate speech. Yeah. Well, it, well. It, it's so, so the answer to that question is yes, but I just would, would qualify it for, just for the sake of accuracy. The, the reality is, as I've said, is that the, the current framework for hate speech already exists in the Human Rights Act. And specifically, it's about whether, it's about whether there's, there's a, 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 something that is threatening, abusive or insulting. And this is the key part, in a manner which is likely to incite to hostility or violence and that's the key part and that's what separates hate speech from you know everyday insults which are unpleasant but we should probably not be getting the government to criminalize even i would accept that and currently in the human rights act uh prescribed or protected groups are on the basis of color race ethnicity or national origin and what the government is proposing is that we only add religious beliefs to that sort of category of of protected groups okay. and they've explicitly said that they're not going to protect lgbt people in that way i say so so you would not see any form of legal action taken against brian tamaki were he to see that again um just uh, for our listeners though brian tamaki made this uh, sermon i think in 2016 so yeah what's that six years ago he actually blamed earthquakes on gays, sinners, and murderers. So I don't think you were quite in the unique category then, I have to <laughs> we're say. We're a good company in that regard. Well, that's then. right. You know, but I mean, seriously, <laughs> so am I. So I'm sitting in there with yeah. you as well. Um, it's a bit like, um, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, strugg I'm struggling to, to take... I, I think if you acted in a way against Brian Tamaki, wouldn't you be really, in lots of ways overreacting on the basis that everybody can see that this is an absurdity? It's a bit like prosecuting well, flat earthers. Well, <laughs> I mean, Brian Tamaki has some pretty colourful views, but unfortunately, probably what we've seen over the last few years is that actually Brian Tamaki's views, even though you or I may consider them ridiculous, have had a hugely influential impact on people, and particularly in regard to his comments that are anti-vax, conspiracy theorists, um, and are actually quite dangerous. Um, and I guess it comes down to whether you think that that's something that should be, should be prescribed against by the government. My person, and I respect that people will have different uh, experiences and different viewpoints. All I'm saying is that my perspective as a, as a gay person is that when you have views that are publicly expressed, which incite violence against the community, whether they be as ridiculous as earthquakes or whether they be as serious as some of the commentary that we've seen in the United States, which leads to events like the recent killing of five gay people in a bar in Colorado, we can see the connection. And I think it is the responsibility of the government of the time to respond, particularly in light of the fact that um, there have been multiple uh, uh, sources now from across the world that have shown that hate crimes against LGBT people 
have increased over the last uh, few years. So to respond to that, I think that we need to create parameters where the, where the rights of people like me and my community are protected. I, I think... Can I, I, well, can I just ask you about that? Because I, yeah. I, you've, you've used that last, the, the most recent shooting. I mean, mm. Sandy Hook was much more, I have to say, uh, horrific than that but we don't immediately well, decide I, I think anyone anyone of any mass shooting of innocent people okay. is terrific well no but i mean it. but say, but but we didn't immediately decide oh god we need new legislation to protect children in this country from whatever it might be um uh, even after there's a child massacre like sandy hook in the united states of america what i'm trying to say is don't you think you're playing this up a bit too much in the sense that um an extreme case in the United States of America of a deranged individual should not be used to try and restrict freedoms in New Zealand? Not at all, because I think, unfortunately, what we saw with Christchurch is that we are not immune to the worst case scenario, or as you described it, the most extreme scenarios here. Um, I remember when Pulse happened, and it was the most significant shooting in the United States uh, and it also happened to be a, a gay hate crime as well, specifically targeted towards LGBT people. And I remember thinking at that time, well, that's awful, and I feel so much pain for my for my gay brothers and sisters across the, across the across the ocean. But I, like many New Zealanders, thought, well, that will never happen here, and it did happen here. And I think we're under a false illusion if we think that it's not possible for something that awful to happen to our community. Yeah, but again, I, I... And I'm not, you know, I, sorry, I just, I, I'm, I'm not someone that's generally prone to sort of being alarmist. I wouldn't say that if I genuinely... No, I, I that accept that, rent. but I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm, as a, yeah, I'm so, so coming back and say, so, well, yes, but you can never safeguard a community against an extremist. I mean, it's exactly the same thing with crime in general, or murder as a specific capital offence, for example. We can't, we don't want it to happen, but murder happens. Um, none, nothing that we can do is going to stop individuals with evil in their heart performing that evil. And Brent and Tarrant, and that's a really good example, nothing that Brent and Tarrant did we could have prevented. He was an evil person with evil in his heart. He'd been radicalised, not in New Zealand, but he came to New Zealand seeking some sort of perverse um, end, I guess. Why should we then have our street of freedoms restricted because of this one individual's perverse actions? Mm, well, I, I, I agree with some of what you're saying, and I think I probably have a different perspective in, in relation to some of the other things that you've said. I think I think I agree with the with the sentiment that you've expressed that we can't prescribe everything and for every every different scenario. And I think um, you know I've been very clear about that. That is my perspective as well. And I think it would be an overreach by the government. And I think it was an overreach by the government to to create such a broad, uh, sweeping and potentially unclear um, set of laws. And I think, you know, there are reasons for that. I think it was very clear that, that Labour had put in place a minister that had clearly checked out at this point. Chris Farfoy had a, had a well-known desire to leave Parliament but was given a very significant piece of legislation to manage, which he bungled, basically, um, in my view, at least. I think... I think the thing is, though, is that there are things that we can do that are non-legislative that can address some of these issues. And that's where we've seen, as we, you know, we talked about earlier, about the improvements that we have seen in society. That's where things like education, um, acceptance, um, that's where we've seen the biggest step forward. And, and, and I, you know, I think we would be amiss to sort of suggest that we have uh, a ban on hate speech without the continued effort within our everyday lives to accept gay and lesbian people and trans people as well. But I, th I think there is a necessity to, to find a way in which we can um, prevent um, harms coming to, to our community. Um, okay. you know, the in, your, in your, but also in your article, you right. said, last year you said uh, in your article, the Ministry of Justice published evidence 
that lesbian, bisexual and gay people in New Zealand are expe experiencing higher levels of victimisation than the national average. Mm. Are you suggesting that that could be resolved in some way by stopping people saying that homosexual acts are sinful or, or similar? I think, I think there is pretty clear evidence that shows that uh, pro, uh, you know, uh, spreading, spreading hateful messaging that incites violence against particular groups, whether they be gay, lesbian, whether they be ethnic minorities, whatever, I think there's some pretty clear examples and there's some pretty clear research that's gone in to show that prescribing uh, hate speech which incites violence will have a positive impact when it comes to things like victimisation, when it comes to crime. Well, can, can um, I take, take you to that um, justice survey, though? Um, mm. the, I then went and looked that up and, um, and I thought, oh, gosh... But what I found was, the, the, just to, uh, for our listeners' point of view, it's the Ministry of Justice latest study, Experience of Crime by Sexual Orientation. Um, and I guess that's the one you've used too. Yes? Mm. Uh, yeah, Ted. Um, but it said, the study found that 47% of bisexual adults are likely to experience crime over a 12-month period compared to 30% for the national average. Okay, so that would seem to back up your, your claim. Mm. But then the next sentence said this, lesbian or gay adults will experience more than double the rate of sexual and violence from their partners yeah. at 33% compared to an average of 16% across all of Aotearoa. I read that paragraph to mean that lesbian or gay adults seem more prone to domestic violence than the average. Did you read it that way well, too? Um, not quite, but I think I, I'm glad that you picked up on that point. It's one of the things that, you know, and I mean, this is sort of slightly wandering down the garden path a little bit, um, but it is it, it, intimate part of a partner violence in the LGBT community is a huge problem. Um, and I think it's not really something that's talked about a lot, but I'm not, not, not to sort of detract from that point. I'm not sure whether that's particularly relevant here when it comes to the issue. Well, no, of because uh, just well, it's just that you cited the fact that um, there was more crime, if you like, against gay and lesbian folk. And I guess mm. what the study showed to me, yeah, they're more likely to be attacked by gay or lesbian folk than they are by straight people. That's I guess that's the point that I was trying to make. Mm, that's probably not how I would interpret that specific part of the study. I think it's more. I think it's more addressing the, the issues that, that gay people have within their own relationships um, and how that leads to intimate partner violence. Not, you know, as a community, we've got some work to do on, in that regard. That, you know, intimate partner violence is not something that is exclusive to, to heterosexual relationships. No, oh, well, well, obviously not according to that study, anyhow. Um, no. Moving on. Um, culturally, there's mm. a clash, isn't there? Now... You say homosexuality is fine. Most of the world in New Zealand agrees with you. Uh, and most of, um, uh, well, obviously, parliaments agree with you because it's passed legislation, uh, effectively ending discrimination, etc. a long time ago. I was part of that parliament, by the way. Um, mm. But then you've got those who believe, uh, whether they are of the Muslim or the Christian faith, that homosexuality, uh, by a literal translation of either the Quran or the Bible, um, is sinful and wrong. Um, should they still be allowed to be able to say that, do you think, to their congregations? Well, I mean, that's, it's an interesting question because, of course, it, it brings, brings the discussion and focus around the inherent nature of our human rights regime in New Zealand which has always been one of balance. Um, religious beliefs and freedom of religion is but one of a suite of different human rights that we're all entitled to. And I think sometimes the conversation around rights um, is not entirely accurate as to the situation that we have in New Zealand. The reality is, is that human rights in New Zealand are never absolute. Um, which always scares people when I say that because uh, they're like, oh my God, um, you know, what does that mean? Uh, the reality is, and, and I'm sure you, you will be aware of this as, as a radio broadcaster, is that, you know, you have freedom of speech, but there are also things that you can't say yeah, right. on the radio yeah. 
which you would get in trouble for. And um, rightly so. Freedom of speech, for example, is not an absolute right in New Zealand, and that is also the case with many other different things. And I think the question that people will be disagreeing on is where you draw the line. And I can only speak from my experience. My experience as a gay person who has experienced discrimination from not just people with religious beliefs, but plenty of secular people who have prejudices as well, is that my right to live in the society as a taxpaying citizen and be free from harassment uh, and violence is uh, as important to human right as as the right for people to voice their opinions freely. I, I understand that, but I think that there wouldn't be one person that's listening to this, Ted, who wouldn't be saying right now, I totally agree with that, we should all be free from harassment and violence, shouldn't we? Well, of course, but the reality, the unfortunate reality is, is that we're not. And often people who are, are gay, lesbian, trans, bisexual are not uh, immune from from that level of harassment and violence. Okay, I want to explore another issue with you, Ted, on the same theme, though. I'm sure. glad you phrased it, the trans issue. Yeah. Um, now, at the moment, as you know, there's a bit of a cultural war. Now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a heterosexual, aged, white male. So I'm sort of sitting on the sidelines watching this with the popcorn, I've got to be honest with you, between, on the one hand, um, feminists, uh, female feminists, uh, and on the other hand, those who, probably like yourself, Ted, uh, would be defending the rights of trans to have full integration into community and be able to self-identify, etc. And there's this culture, it seems from my perspective anyhow, for this cultural war to have been unleashed between those two forces over the rights, the responsibilities, the place um, in society of trans folk. Have I... If I got that right, there is it, 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 it is a cultural war between the people that you represent and between a sort of radical feminist group? Well, what I would say initially is, have you ever thought about a career in the theatre? Because you, you definitely have a perchance for the dramatics. I would not describe uh, the situation in regards to trans right as a cultural war at all. I think the reality is, is that there is a small group of people who have very um, uh, hardened attitudes and ideas towards our tra the trans people in our community and feel uh, that they have somehow been maligned because trans people have begun to exercise their human rights. I mean, the reality is, is that trans people are part of our communities there. <laughs> our brothers, there are sisters, there are co-workers, there are teachers, our doctors and our police people. And they have been for as long as human beings have, have walked this earth, there have been uh, different variances of gender expression and identity. Uh, the reality is, is that most New Zealanders uh, who know trans people and have trans people in their daily lives, uh, it's not an issue and they know them as the, as the people that they know and love. Um, there are, however, as you're, I'm sure you're aware, people who have very strong views at the extreme end, um, and those views are hateful and damaging. Um, but, again, it's all part of the wider conversation that we seem to be well, having Well, you see, about but, the, uh, but, but I don't know that I am being dramatic because we've had people here who seem to be sort of mainstream feminists in this country who argue well, that trans uh, men in particular, or men who have transitioned into women, are not entitled to be regarded as women, and they argue that from a very strong feminist ideology, ideological perspective. Mm. I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, well, my perspective would be that trans exclusionary radical feminists, which is the term for those, those people and their views, um, I probably would not consider them to be mainstream feminists. I think mainstream feminists respect uh, that trans women are women and that they uh, live as women in our, in our lives and you know, I don't think that they have a problem with trans people. All right, but, okay, you call them TERFs, so let's just go quickly to that terminology then. Are TERFs not entitled to have a point of view and express that opinion? Would that be hate speech to you to express those well, opinions? Well, of course they're entitled, and 
don't we all know it? Um, they <laughs> make such a song and dance. And the reality is, is that uh, it's, it's it's humorous. That one of them uh, appeared on a on a ra- notoriously appeared on a radio show with Ken Hill and talked about how her freedom of speech had been completely maligned and had been sidelined. And but there she was with an entire what an hour of airtime to express her views. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, you know. I, th- I think I think their concerns are completely overinflated. And as someone that has many trans people in my life who I love and care about, I don't really understand the moral crisis. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, that's their perspective. I mean, um, it's ironic in actual of fact course. that they have found common cause with Old Testament preachers, basically, on that issue. But there you go. I uh, wouldn't have put those <laughs> two together. And Donald Trump and many conservatives uh, are, are along the, you know, alt-right fringe. So... But uh, I, I not guess, particularly. You but, know. But, but the really good thing is, and this is why I guess I'm, I got you on the program, Ted, was to talk about the idea that sometimes talking about these things openly and publicly, not trying to criminalise them, not trying to marginalise people's, you call them prejudice, they've got a point of view, whatever, it, 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 it seems to me that that discourse makes things better because in the discussion you start to understand Certainly those people on the sidelines start to understand better. What do you think? Well, I mean, it's interesting that you, that you, that you say that. I think one of the things that is troubling about the proposal by the government, particularly the Minister of Justice, is that to me it um, signals that the government is not willing to engage in these conversations. And look, you'll, you will remember, and I mean, you said it yourself at the, at the start of the interview, during the 1980s, the debate was was positively toxic. I mean, I mean, I wasn't around, but you can read the records of the of the level of discourse. It was horrible. But this is the reality of it, and actually, it's the reality of every single pr- uh, sort of legislative progression that we've seen for LGBT people. There has been a fairly fairly toxic element of the debate, um, and my, I guess. Uh, upset with the government is that they're not willing to take that on the chin and show leadership. Um, unfortunately, there will be elements of the discussion that are unpleasant, but it can't be an excuse not to do anything. All right. Um, so we, we're next. So the government's said that it's not going to do it, um, although it's going to do it for religious reasons. I can see some politics involved there. I'm sure you can as well. Um, where next for you and the group's uh, of people that you represent because if Labor's not going to do it this term when they're so activist on everything else the future looks a bit bleak doesn't it for changing the law at all well I think again I think and I think I, we would probably have to respectfully disagree that this is hardly an activist government I would consider it really quite conservative in a lot of its approaches and shies away from a lot of meaningful reform, but I guess that's, you know, different perspectives for you. I think in terms of next steps, well, the government's kept this problem to the Law Commission to deal with whilst it makes an immediate change for the religious communities, which, of course, I support, because um, I think that it should protect not just queer people, but those, those religious minorities as well, but that's beside the point. I think the next step for our community is I think we need to make our voices heard, and I think it starts with people writing to their local MPs that if, there's, if they've, uh, they care about the, the gay, lesbian, trans people in their lives uh, and they want them to be free from, from violence and harassment and they want to see the government do something about it, they should write to their local MP. Um, they should do what I do, which is uh, uh, write to your local newspaper, say that there's something that you want to talk about and really exercise that freedom we were talking about of freedom of speech. Um, that's the first thing to do. Um, in terms of next steps, officially, I, I haven't seen anything within the community as of yet that will start sort of putting pressure on the government. I'm aware that there are petitions starting, so perhaps we'll see something happen in the next couple of weeks. All right. Ted, thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate the conversation um, and the discussion. Uh, I wish you well in your future career. Thank you so much. Thank you. You too. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. That's um, Ted Greensmith West. Um, he's written an article on Stuff Magazine, which has been, as you would expect, uh, lovingly uh, <laughs> published by 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 um, by Stuff. 
Uh, it's called Hate Speech Back Down is a Sign of a Government Unwilling to Stand by LGBTQ People. Uh, and <coughs> you would have, he is an Auckland-based lawyer specialising in, in actual fact, uh, law reform for lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, trans and queer folk.